going to be recording this so we can keep it for an archive. And welcome, everybody. So welcome. Thank you for joining us for our last call of the year. And we are um, joined by our chief economist, David Horner. And I'm sure many of you have been reading him this year. And you can check, learn more about him on our website if you're not familiar with David and his background. But we wanted to talk specifically about inflation and de deflation today because it's a question that comes up in the news a lot. And um, the purpose of today's call is to just go over the basics of the economic basics that drive inflation and or deflation and have David help us understand that so that we can come to our own assessments and better navigate the news that we're hearing all the time in the media. So thank you for joining our call. I, um, let me turn this up here. I'm going to go ahead and mute the lines. Most of them are muted already. I'm not currently getting any background noise, but uh, some of you may not be muted if you've come in later to the call. So just be aware and thank you for muting things on your side. Um, if you would like to ask a question and you're logged in online, you can go ahead and type me a message and I will repeat the question or unmute you. And um, you can you know, ask the question, whichever you prefer. And I, I, we are recording this call. And so it will be available for playback in bond school. So before I let David get started, I wanted to, um, to say that, again, we want to look at the theory behind inflation and what drives that. And what I put on the screen here is a quote from one of David's recent, recent pieces that he was referring to an article that was written in, uh, I think, the New York Times, but Failing to refer, to refer to the theory behind inflation leaves me wondering if their emphasis is too focused on the dangers of inflation as opposed to a further decline in V, which, should the Fed rein in their base, would lead to disrupted deflation. So, of course, that sounds kind of scary, this disrupted deflation. So, we, would, we want to ask David, we're going to go through a series of questions, and so David can answer for us and help us understand what is going on here. Sound good? Sound good to you, David? Oh, yes, fine. Okay, fine. perfect. So um, let me just really quickly say that we're going to talk today and ask you questions about the velocity of money, velocity and leverage, those terms, how they're different, how they're the same. How does leverage impact prices? How does the demographics impact, impact inflation? And what's the bigger risk? And that means inflation or deflation. And these are just you know often questions that I have in my mind. And so I think that it would be helpful to understand, review the basics. So I started with oh. I started with a picture. So I'll let you get started, David. But right now on the screen, oh, thank you, Steve. Hang on. If if you'll be specific, asking the questions, I'll 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 I'll, I'll go over them and answer them as you ask them. Okay, perfect. So I um I read your you know, the recent piece that you wrote, and you've written a lot about inflation and deflation recently. So I, my first question is just help us understand what velocity is and this M times V topic. So what this, the, the chart that's on this screen right now is this very simplistic a a velocity. In my mind, I think of the basics of a deposit becomes a loan because a deposit becomes a loan and money gets used over and over. And when we have a low velocity, then money gets used fewer times. And then if we have a high velocity, it gets used more. So I have that graphic on the screen of just showing that repeated cycle. So if you could just explain that to make sure we're understanding that correctly, that would be, that would be great. Okay. Uh, let me just do a little bit of background here first. Uh, 45 years ago when I was in graduate school, uh, Milton Friedman was – far and away the most uh, prominent um, a, a person to espouse how monetary theory works. And uh, basically, uh, if you've had a course in a basic 101 economics, uh, you, you come across this equation that uh, basically money times how fast the money turns over uh, is equal to what is produced in the economy um, uh, times the uh, prices. So velocity is, as you point out in that slide, it's how it's not so much how money turns over, which the slide shows, but how fast it turns over. 
Um, so uh, as, as it turns over faster, and there's a number of ways that it can turn over, uh, the bank loans are certainly one of them. But another is transaction. How uh, transactions? How how fast do people uh, spend their cash? Um, so whereas uh, you, you may have heard over the last several years, people worried about inflation because the the monetary base, the the, the Fed's money um, that it's it's holding that it, it puts out uh, and in, in, into the banks is increasing very very rapidly. Uh, each time, each month, they buy 85 billion worth of additional securities. That puts that money uh, into the, uh, the the banking system because they have to pay for those uh, securities that they buy and hold on their balance sheet. But as I've written, um, the velocity of money has gone down dramatically uh, because of the financial crisis. Um, the uh, banks have to hold more capital, for example, um, and uh, also people were very much scared after the tra after the crisis, and and they turn their money over. That is, they they spend their cash uh, basically less uh, less quickly. Um, and how you spend your cash, that is the tech, what I call the technology, which I wrote about in last um, uh, week's weekly, uh, ha has increased dramatically over the last 45 years. So uh, basically, uh, when Friedman uh, won his Nobel Prize, he, he was an advocate of the idea that velocity is very stable. So uh, you, you don't want to increase the money supply very quickly because uh, once you're producing at full production, that just drives prices up. Um, now, the world has changed because of this technology, and velocity goes up and down very quickly for a variety of reasons. Um, and we'll get into some of those questions and, and reasons with some of your, your, your next questions. So well, basically, velocity is how fast uh, money is, is used in the economy, how many times it turns over in a month or a year. Okay, so just to make sure, I mean, I obviously am making this very simple on this velocity chart but and you were talking about monetary power or money times velocity is the more relevant thing we should be looking at versus just the amount of money in the system so is there another piece that we should really have in this equation to account for this speed that of turnover well uh, Friedman's original um, view of this was that velocity is a function of or that is relies on uh, very predictable variables but the answer is uh, to your question is, is yes once globalization and the technology of money which allowed people uh, for example we, we get with the Bitcoin is the latest example that people can make these transactions without regard to the Fed controls um, also, because of globalization, foreigners uh, put money in and spend dollars because a lot of the world's trade is done in dollars very quickly. So certainly that that's important. And then the leverage that people use. I mean, a lot of money is not just used for transactions, which is how you get the original equation, but it's also used for purchases of assets. And those purchases can increase and decrease very quickly. For example, one of the things that has driven the velocity down and allows the, not only allows the Fed, but makes it important for the Fed to add money to compensate for this, is the fact that um, with the, with the, essentially the, uh, the financial crisis, a, a crash in, in many assets, there were less financial institutions um, to turn over that money. And second of all, um, people went to cash. It's, it's what uh, John Maynard Keynes, who, by the way, was a monetarist, and so people that followed him that weren't, um, he, as, as he pointed out, you get into what's called a liquidity crisis. People don't want to spend their money. They don't want to make transactions. Uh, and thus the, the Fed can shove as much money out as it wants. But if it doesn't turn over, then it, it really doesn't stimulate the economy or prices, which is why we've had no inflation to speak of, maybe a percent or two, because the Fed wants to have a little bit of inflation. Deflation is dangerous. And again, I think you have a question that where we can talk about that. So, yes, there's a lot of factors. But I would say the main thing to take away from this is that, unfortunately, although uh, Friedman was one of my mentors, um, that velocity is now not a, a stable function anymore. It's no longer a stable function uh, of, of these predictable variables. So it's very difficult for the Fed 
The Fed knows very clearly that velocity is, has collapsed after the financial crisis, um, and they're certainly hopeful that it will re-expand, uh, but until it does, they've, they've got to keep putting money into, into the economy. Okay, so the next slide that I have up is this, my question, is the Fed balance sheet and also known as monetary money supply. So am I even correct in thinking of that the same as money supply in the Fed balance sheet? So that's my first question. But uh, not, not exactly. There, there, I, I don't want to make this too complicated. There's a number of definitions of money supply. There's M1, M2, okay. uh, M1Z, M3. But you can say this. When they're putting that money into the system, it allows for more what I would call fuel to be in the economy. So, yes, um, I mean, I think for the, our purposes, you can think that an increase in the Fed purchases of assets, uh, bonds or, or mortgage, puts more money into the system. Okay. Uh, th there are other things that, that, that affect the money supply, but, but that, that's certainly a good basic. Okay, so for the basic, then I say if M times velocity equation is such an important factor, my question is why do so people, few people talk about it? Because it seems pretty important if we always are talking about this, we went from 800 billion to 4 trillion and the Fed balance sheet. But if our velocity was at 10, and I'm just using numbers, I'm for illustration purposes only. But if, if velocity was at 10 when we had an $800 billion balance sheet, and now velocity is at 2, we have a $4 trillion, that has the net effect of having the same impact on the economy. Is that a correct way to think of it, about this? I, I think it is. I, I, again, I, I want to emphasize it's a lot more complicated and complex than okay. that. Okay. But, yes, when you hear these talking heads uh, on CNBC and other people uh, as you did four or five years ago, right after the crisis, saying we, we, we're going to have inflation. Um, that's correct. They, I mean, number one, they don't understand economics. Uh, I, mean, I mean, they don't understand monetary theory. Uh, and By the way, the Fed does. Uh, so uh, you think you can rest re – it, it's a difficult job that the Fed has, but at least they understand how it works. Um, and uh, so, yes. Is 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 uh, is the answer that uh, many of the people you hear um, talking? I mean, they may be good fund managers, they may be good uh, advisors, etc. But that doesn't mean they really understand monetary theory. So yes, it, 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 you don't hear many people talking about it, and that's why there's a lot of confusion. I think. Okay. All right. So that helps it explain. I'm understanding again, it's very simple, but we just want to just make sure that we can get through the understanding the, what people are talking about. So my next slide is about the power of money. So you've been talking about the importance of looking at these other factors instead of just the overall amount of money. But what are the differences? I, I, I always think about leverage as banks used to be levered three, 30 to one, now they're levered you know, 25 to one. And we also hear a lot about capital ratios, which I, which I believe is just another way to talk about the leverage that banks can hold. And, and velocity, like what are the differences between these concepts? Okay. I, uh, and, and I guess this is, uh, again, trying to simplify, I, I often make the technical mistake of equating the two, we talk about leverage, and many people do, because they don't really talk about velocity, but equating uh, leverage to velocity. But in fact, there, there are two things that um, are, are terribly important here, and this, this is really um, – what differentiates uh, the simple monetary theory from the, the true or, or complex monetary theory, and that is that money goes in not only to transactions, um, and that's where you get that equation MV equals PQ, okay. uh, price times quantity of, the, of goods, but it also goes into the support of asset prices. In fact, the, the, that's exactly why the Fed is adding uh, at buying these purchases because it's trying to boost asset prices, which will make people feel richer, and therefore it'll it'll contribute to uh, their purchases. They're trying to increase demand right now uh, so they can get more people employed. So leverage refers essentially to the velocity uh, or, or or that that people use, or not the velocity, but the the amount to which they're willing to to leverage, the, the name leverage, their assets. So leverage applies to assets. Okay. 
Um, and, uh, for example, as, as I'm sure most of the, the people on the line know who, who trade these assets, I mean, if you're a, a local um, uh, uh, entity, a, a, a Fed or, or, I'm sorry, a state or local uh, a treasurer, you don't want to use leverage or not very much of it. Occasionally you might um, uh, uh, reach for yield. But you're not going to go on margin in your treasury accounts. They're just uh, too important not to take risk. But if you're a hedge fund like me, um, you may get you may buy three times the assets of the money you have and borrow the the two thirds if you think your return will exceed what your borrowing costs are. And it's that in the financial crisis which was crushed. It was crushed because. Those taking a lot of leverage, like Morgan Stanley and Bear Stearns and Lehman and uh, Merrill Lynch, were basically um, either uh, went kaput because they couldn't support their transactions, but they crashed, and their 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 loss in net asset value exceeded uh, their their um, uh, their capital, uh, or they had to combine, as Merrill Lynch did, for example. Um, or, or dig their way out, as, as, uh, uh, as Morgan Stanley did, um, of, of their situation. Fortunately, people like Morgan Stanley had enough capital, um, e even back then, uh, that, that they were able to survive, whereas Lehman and, and Bear Stearns didn't. Merrill would not have had enough capital, uh, so it, it was basically pushed into uh, the arms of, of Bank of America, which okay. had coveted Merrill anyways for, ma for many yeah. years. So. Uh, that, that's why velocity, uh, that's why leverage got crushed, crushed and that all then fed back to essentially bring down velocity uh, okay. dramatically. So well, leverage really sense. has to do with the, with the financing of assets, whereas velocity is more of the turnover of money that people use to make their transactions. But they're okay. very, very much interrelated. Okay, that's, that's really good to make that clarification. And so am I correct in just capital ratios is just the tool that the regulators use in order to monitor or manage the leverage that the firms are able to take on? Is that you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and the problem that existed in the 1980s and 90s uh, and I, I refer to my most weekly, my most recent weekly, Arthur Burns. He was an inflation fighter. He had good credentials in inflation fighter, but he didn't understand. And this goes to the power of money. He didn't understand that all the technology of money, first the introduction of the euro dollars, uh, which contributed to globalization, uh, and and then uh, the fact uh, later on, more recently, before the financial crisis, that banks were able to effectively get around the Fed's capital by having off-balance sheet transactions, mm -hmm. all of that contributed to the leverage that these companies could take. Um, I mean, that one of the classic cases was long-term capital, uh, which um, had very ri almost riskless uh, securities from uh, uh, Netherlands, which were almost riskless, but they were leveraged so much, 100 to 1, that even small moves essentially uh, threatened or, or, in their case, wiped out their capital. Uh, but these were very good positions, and when the, the, the uh, counterparties took those on, they were able to make a lot of money by just holding those positions because they did have the capital to uh, have those positions. They bought them at fire sale they prices, and uh, they held on to maturity and got much, much greater returns than they would have um, if if they were un if the positions had been unleveraged, so yes, the the increase in capital that the um, that the Fed has required is basically uh, to make sure that people don't take those kinds of le the banks and 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 hidden funds don't take that uh, kind of leverage. Nevertheless, funds aren't subject. Uh, I mean, they're they're certainly they don't want to go out of business, so they they keep uh, uh, capital. And they keep a lot more than they used to. So there's been more or, or less the scare effect that, that has, has kept those entities that are not regulated uh, directly by the Fed uh, having more capital. But, yes, the banks themselves, which are actually responsible for uh, the everyday transactions in the economy, they're required to have a lot more capital. But also all of the banks brought their off-balance sheet items onto the balance sheet and therefore subject to the capital. So really it's a twofold reason why, number one, 
velocity and leverage has gone down, and number two, why why we're a lot safer now than 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 we were before. So this one making more money subject to the um, uh, the, the the capital requirements and two increasing the capital requirements. But let me warn. I mean, as, as you may know, that a, a lot of people were worried that we. I mean, I, I, people started talking about another crisis almost as soon as the. Uh, as we were a year beyond the, the previous crisis, generally crises don't happen when the when the the, the regulatory agencies are, are are on the on the case and when the banks themselves um, have just gone through it. They happen when we get lax again. For example, uh, this introduction of the Bitcoin, for example, you know that's so small and so inconsequential that it won't cause a crisis now, but people will find ways over time to essentially get around regulation. And that's why we get these crises uh, every uh, maybe three or four decades apart, maybe. But, you know, it certainly could happen again. And, and, and But it, it's not likely to happen now because the main assets uh, of, the, um, of the U.S. and Europe um, and Japan, uh, but definitely Europe and, and the U.S., are – very heavily regulated and have much better capital requirements now than they had before. Okay, thank you. Okay, so my next slide that I have is um, the impact of leverage on prices. That's the question we've been getting from some of our students. And of course, as bond investors, we're very concerned about inflation and prices. So um, you've quoted a study and very you know frequently about that 40% of growth in recent years can be attributed to the increase in debt. So is it correct then to assume that a decrease in debt leverage or velocity, decrease in, that a decrease in leverage, I guess, or debt, will also lead to a decrease in prices? No, no, not necessarily. It leads to a it leads to a decrease in P. It leads to a decrease in the growth of PQ, that is price times quantity. Mm -hmm. So it could have a negative impact on prices, as, as for example, as happened in Japan. Um, but it could also have a negative effect on, on the quantities uh, that we buy. I mean, that's exactly why the Fed came in very strongly with quantitative easing, uh, because uh, we, you know we do have the example of Japan, we do have the example of the depression, um, and uh, in in our depression, prices went down by 50 percent, a lot more than they've gone down in Japan. Um, and I know you're going to get into demographics later, but there's a number of things that can affect prices over time. But definitely, if you contract too quickly, uh, I mean the main problem is the quantity goes down. There's people stop buying, and you have a, a, a recession, which can turn into a depression, and then. That obviously businesses have to compete for what business there is, and that drives prices down. So uh, you, you really can't say in advance um, that, uh, you know, oh, prices will go down, but quantity won't, or vice versa. But you can say that there'd be a negative impact um, of a crisis on, on, on the, the prices times quantity. Okay. And that's what the Fed has been, you know, basically um, uh, attempting and, and successfully to control. So, for example, although there's virtually, I mean, there's very little inflation in the U.S., they want to keep it somewhat positive, and they've been successful in keeping it uh, uh, positive. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for reminding me about that. And this is good for me. I hope that you call, um, everyone's appreciating the, like, the refresher on these econ classes that we probably had a gazillion years ago, because I really do think they, we, it helps us to better assess the big picture. So um, my next slide is what's the bigger risk? Um, we know the Fed's dual mandate is to keep prices stable and maximize employment. And for the last several decades, the Fed and investors have been much more concerned about inflation than deflation. Um, given the fact that the Fed and other central banks are happy to pump money into the system, they don't seem to be concerned about inflation, appears to me. Does it make sense to think that central bankers may be more concerned about deflation? Well, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, this goes back to your point about 40% of the growth since the 1980s uh, was due to increased debt. Uh, the power of money uh, allowed uh, not only people uh, buying assets to, to have leverage, uh, but there was this underlying willingness of banks uh, and, and, and willingness of households 
to borrow more to finance their growth. And that, hence the study that showed perhaps as much as 40% of growth uh, was by increased debt. But as you, as you know, I mean, you, you, your debt, your, your, your credit rating, ultimately, if you accumulate enough debt, will go down and you won't be able to uh, borrow and that will stop you dead in the water. So basically, when the crisis hit, um, the Fed realized that the private sector in both the asset and in the transaction area was simply they're, – they're, they're, they're they were either not going to take out more debt or their debt was uh, – or, or their assets were wiped out and they, 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 could, they would default. And as a result of that, uh, well, the, I know many people don't like the fact that the government took on a trillion-dollar stimulus, but the Fed realized and cooperated with Congress at that point – that drastic measures were needed to avoid uh, the recession turning into a depression. And so you needed not only essentially to increase the money supply, but you needed to quickly create some alternative source of demand. So while my, myself included would criticize uh, maybe some of the ways that the, that the money was spent, we needed, and, and Alan Blinder, who I respect dramatically, a former yeah, vice chair of the Fed, that. that we probably should have even had more than a trillion. But we should have spent it on investments, infrastructures, to make ourselves or to help make ourselves more competitive. That's a different issue. Yeah. But it does get to the issue that um, with the which you want, and, and which is that the decline – uh, in the willingness to take debt or the use of debt to gain growth means that we're basically for a long period of time probably slated to have lower growth. And uh, PIMCO, for example, talked about this and calls it the new normal. I like that term and I, I, I call it that too. The new normal is that the level of growth that the U.S. economy can sustain over time if we don't re um, uh, basically uh, renew our, our, our reliance on debt, at least not to the extent that it, it gives us a poor credit rating, um, our, our, our potential growth has, would be reduced. Now, there are ways we can increase the potential growth. Uh, productivity is certainly one of them, and, 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 the, and I think our private corporations have actually done a pretty good job of, of increasing productivity. Uh, but, um, but basically... Uh, it's certainly over the next decade or two, we are unlikely to take on the kind of debt um, that drove a lot of the growth we had in the 80s and 90s for two reasons. Number one, um, state and local governments are, 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 are being forced essentially to uh, either cut the income that will go to, to pensioners or future pensioners or alternatively to set more funds aside, which means probably more taxes. So uh, that, from certainly the, the, the public sector uh, and then add to that the federal government, which is, you know, has been actually reigning in its, its, its deficits uh, quite well over the uh, – again, I, I don't necessarily agree with the way they've done it. The sequester was a very inefficient way to do it. But we're, we're beginning to rein in our, our deficits uh, as well, although uh, down the road uh, in the longer term they'll, they'll begin to increase again because of the entitlement programs. So basically it's very unlikely that in the public sector, whether it be state, local, or federal – uh, that will will get a lot of stimulus from increased debt uh, in the near term, and then in the private sector, uh, I mean, look at all the cash. I mean, the the the, the, the business sector is fabulous in terms of uh, conserving and building its cash levels to avoid a problem, and they don't seem too willing to spend it on investment yet because the demand from the private sector uh, has has been somewhat tepid. Uh, again, because uh, households are still repairing their debt situation, eventually, and, and we're coming in line with uh, probably over the next two years uh, with levels of debt that are sustainable, um, then debt should increase basically with the increases in income. I mean, there's nothing wrong with debt, but as debt increases as a proportion of the underlying household uh, incomes that support the payment of that debt, uh, that becomes a problem. That's what happened in the 80s and 90s. So. Basically, we're 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 not. Our growth is probably not going to be driven dramatically by by debt in the in the next few years, and that's why the Fed feels comfortable with putting a lot of you know, building its balance sheet, uh, basically to offset that potential for uh, uh, for uh, essentially uh, the limited growth. Okay, so you're saying it sounds to me this is all very good 
it sounds to me that you're saying that the Fed is not that worried about inflation. But do you think, evidenced by their actions, that they may be worried about more worried about deflation than they're letting on? Or and I know that's a lot. Well, of I think they were. I think they were. I, I think that's changing. I mean, I see um, what a lot of people on Wall Street call the green shoots. I, I do see some very good things going on. I mean, number one, I mean the the federal deficit's getting under control. Number two, um, uh, places like Detroit have brought home to uh, to the states and, and and local governments that. They really need to address their, their their pension problems. But a lot of that's underway. I mean, if I thought that – I mean, that, and I'm not, by the way, saying we couldn't have another crisis, but the crisis wouldn't come from the monetary system. It would come from uh, – or the, the say that it would be a local crisis like that, that in Detroit. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I think the Fed is feeling a little more comfortable – um, about uh, the prospects for uh, deflation. And by the way, if, the, if prices go down, isn't necessarily bad or good. Uh, Jim Grant was on uh, the CNBC this morning as a guest uh, saying that the that, that price declines are good. Uh, well, in, in 1870, uh, I remember it, but most of your younger guests won't. Uh, uh, yes, I said 1870, mm-hmm. following the Civil War uh, to uh, 1900. Um, there was so much productivity increases in the U.S. that prices went down, and that was fine. The economy did very well. But that's not why prices would have gone down after a financial crisis. They would have gone down because Q would have gone down. In other words, a recession, uh, and and that would turn into a negative, vicious spiral. And that's what the Fed was worried about. I think they're less worried about it now. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why I think they'll begin to reduce their purchases fairly soon. It could happen, as you know, as early as tomorrow. I I think they may lay out somewhat of more of a plan because they definitely want to get started. I don't actually think they're going to decrease the purchases until they see what fourth quarter growth is, which will be released at the end of January, which is uh, basically the same time as their next meeting. Okay. So um, I, I think they're less worried about deflation now, but they certainly don't want to take their eye off the ball. And by the way, just one more thing, uh, I'm not sure you're going to get to this, but it's very important, is just because I think the Fed is doing a good job and just because I think the Fed knows what it's doing, that doesn't make it easier because at, at the bottom line here is, and going back to the discussion of V, as I mentioned, V is no longer uh, a, a stable function, and it's no longer easily predictable. It's very, very difficult. The Fed has a lot more information than most of the talking heads do, and has more information than I do. So presumably, they'll do the best they can. But it's going to be very difficult to steer that razor's edge, essentially, of gradually weaning the economy from these increases in purchases and not getting back into the problem of having to worry about a de- declining Q quantity, that is our production, or prices. Okay. At the same time, because as, as Friedman said, um, inflation works with a long and variable lag. Um, they, If they just keep pouring out money too long, too fast, um, eventually, there's no question, but it will as the economy picks up, the animal spirits of of, of production pick up, people spend more, they feel better, then if you run against the, the, the boundaries of our ability to produce, or we run out of labor, or, or we haven't really invested enough in capital, then yes, prices could increase and they could begin to, that could begin to spiral out of control. So there, I, I don't want to minimize the danger I'm simply saying that that's a future problem that people were talking about four years ago when the real problem was potentially a, a, a collapse in Q and or P. Okay. Now I've got I've got two more slides, just some hopefully a couple more minutes, and we can ask some questions. But I think that this might be something that is a big contributing factor, and that's demographics. So, is the population trend in the U.S. supportive of inflation or deflation? And my second part of the question is, should we be concerned with world population trends versus just focusing on the U.S. trends? Well, let's take the U.S. first. Uh, The answer, unfortunately, is that uh, with the baby boomers aging, um, um, uh, there's been a study done uh, by uh, Bob Arnott, who many of you may know. He, he, by the way, is one of the – people you often see on, on, on TV, et cetera, who is very, very good because he does his homework, he does his research, and he understands 
uh, monetary theory, and and he really and he's he's kind of an expert in demographics, although he's a fund manager. He's he's got a very good background, and uh, he did a rec uh, recent study that was uh, in the uh, uh, the CFA, the uh, uh, Institute magazine, that basically indicates that as the as the aging cohorts, that is, the older a group of people are, say 60 to 65, 65 to 70, etc. Uh, the less they're likely to spend, and the more they're likely to spend out of their assets. So basically, the aging demographics can have a negative effect both on growth in the economy and on asset prices, such as stock prices or bond prices. Um, so uh, yes, it, 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 it can have a negative impact. Now, that your, your question about whether we should be more concerned about the world, that that's perhaps even more important because in the case of Japan, the demographic the demographic situation is much more dire in the U.S. It's going to be very hard for Japan uh, to stimulate growth. In fact, you know their debt is well over 200 uh, times their their production now. Uh, generally, it's if it, it, the, the, and this is a public debt. Fortunately, the the private sector has much more savings in the U.S. because the Japanese were big savers when we were big big spenders. But nevertheless. Uh, their demographics have led to con per pretty persistent price pressures on the downside, um, and uh, and and small growth. Um, so yes, uh, it, it, the, and, and because we're a globalized world, that this has feedback effect on the U.S. Europe, uh, especially Eastern Europe, also. I mean, Eastern Europe uh, under the Soviet rule uh, on, until um, Glasnost um, had uh, very, very low uh, uh, population increases, so they had an aging population. China had a one-child policy, which they're, be they're reversing now. Uh, so their demographics uh, are also such that you have an aging population. So uh, yes, uh, the, 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 the potential negative from this is reinforced, uh, by uh, the world demographics. Now there is a positive. Um, many countries, uh, especially the, the emerging market countries, um, have uh, tend to have higher birth rates. Historically, this has been somewhat of a problem because what you had is poor people having more kids, wealthier nations and people having less kids, uh, and uh, this could, uh, you know, it's put a burden uh, on our ability to transfer wealth to make sure people were fed and housed. However, with the increase in the use of energy resources and commodities, a lot of these emerging markets, look at Mexico right now is, is kind of the poster child, but Brazil, um, Russia, which was very backward, all of these, these countries um, uh, that and some of having higher birth rates are now doing better. Uh, so the, the positive here is that as they do better and continue to do better, their demand will increase because they'll have more in their, more people in their middle classes. So uh, on balance, the fact that China, big, big nation, um, and, um, and, and Japan, U.S., and Europe uh, have aging demographics, um, uh, and it can be offset to some extent by Mexico, Brazil, to a lesser extent India. I mean, a lot of population, but uh, growth isn't necessarily as high as, as, as it might be, say, in Mexico or Brazil. So the answer is they're cross currents, but on average, yeah, I mean, on, on, uh, in, in putting it in perspective, uh, there are some major demographic problems going, going forward, both in the U.S. and uh, in the uh, uh, abroad and, and one final thing. I mean, this gets talked about a lot. Um, I, I, I'm not here to advocate depriving people of, of benefits they worked all their life for, uh, but it's going to be difficult. Uh, that we're, we're probably going to have to both raise revenues on the one hand and curb the growth and entitlement programs, which must mean some people are going to get less than they thought they would get uh, in the future. And that's because um, we 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 we've promised too much and we didn't invest enough. Uh, if you've read my comments for the last five or six years, I'm a big advocate, probably the biggest problem I think we have is we have under-invested, and therefore um, it's going to become somewhat harder to support the people that are not active in the population, even if they've you know, worked, uh, worked their butts off for uh, 40 or 45 years. And that's, uh, that's, that's a problem. Okay, um, so I just, this last one is, maybe not able to answer in a super quick thing and I want to open it up for questions but are there are there any indicators that we should be watching just 
I, I don't know, for if we're concerned about are we going to go, are we heading towards more deflationary? Are we heading towards inflation? Um, or just are, are things that we, we should, you think we should keep our eyes open for that would be relatively easy for us to track? Or is that just way too complex to go into here? Well, you know, I, I think we should have another conference. So this, this this could take as long as I've taken already to All kind right. of discuss in the case why they're important. But let me at least, and, and I do want to open up to questions um, uh, about monetary policy and inflation, uh, if there are any, especially since this is a time when the Fed is probably going to be in transition. But let me just say one thing. Yes, employment, employment, employment. I mean, the, the Europe, Europe, in Japan do not have a, a dual mandate like the U.S. does. And one of the reasons, and, and as, a, as you know, I'm very much an advocate of QE, but one of the reasons QE came about, or at least one of the justifications, was that the Fed does have a mandate to try to get unemployment down when it's higher than needed, uh, higher than what, what's called the, 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 the sustainable or full employment and uh, full uh, full production uh, when we're at our potential growth in point full um, uh, yeah, I, I can't break down the word. Anyway, yeah. so full employment. So and and with Q, uh, with, with basically U um, U16. I mean, we, we've got a lot of hidden unemployment, as or, or it's not so hidden now that they have these measures. But there's a lot of unemployment, and and uh, they, that is probably the well, it is the single reason. Uh, why, for example, Janet Yellen, who is very, very good, I've followed her stuff for years, uh, has said we have to be very careful about tapering uh, quantitative easing because we're nowhere near full employment if you consider all the discouraged workers and all the people that could come into the labor market uh, if, uh, if the prospects were better. We're certainly doing better. Okay. And, and that doesn't mean we're not going to grow. In fact, there's a lot of room for growth here uh, because we're not at full potential. But that's the single indicator. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, we can have another call after the first of the year, which I can't believe it's almost here. But um, for the time being, I'm going to unmute you guys. So um, if you have any calls, so I'm not getting any background noise. So if I think it's okay, let's see. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can type me. There's a few of you that are not on mute. You can unmute. There you are. Okay. The lines are open. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if you can um, chime in or if you may be on mute on your end. I'm not sure. But do you guys have any questions? Any questions, comments about anything David talked about? Either I've answered all the questions or I've confused everybody significantly. So they're scratching their heads. Yeah, you confused <laughs> everyone. Um, I have one question from um, the audience. It's how effective is QE if credit is not being extended to business customers, especially small business? Well, that's one of the, um, that's one of the problems. Uh, I mean, let's put it, as you know, as a big advocate, it's, it's more effective than not doing it. But uh, as, uh, I mean, one of uh, the tenets of, that John Maynard Keynes had, and one of the reasons he advocated temporary government spending in, in crisis times, was because many people, uh, monetarists in, in particular, um, uh, suggest that uh, it, you know, there's a danger when you're increasing money supply and a full employment that you, you'll cause a spiraling inflation. But conversely, when you don't have it and when there's a danger of deflation, uh, many people have, have, have described monetary policy as pushing on a string. Um, so the answer is it's not as effective as we'd like it to be. I, I mean, when you know people like Rick, Centelli, who I think you know hasn't got a clue about monetary policy, but he, when he gets on and he says uh, basically, uh, uh, it's not working, it's not doing it. But there's some credit truth to that. It it hasn't. I mean that you know Alan Blinder's answer is so do more. Um, uh, uh, Kruger, I mean, you know, many people don't like uh, Kruger, Nobel Prize, very smart guy, but he's kind of a um, a leftist. Uh, you know, he'd say the same thing. Well, then do more of it. And I guess I have to say, as a as a uh, um, as an economist, um, I mean, there's two ways uh, essentially uh, to make it work. Um, one, you, you you put more out, and number two, you create an alternative source of demand. Um, and there's dangers in that because um, the, the, the only two ways to uh, to do it, if if if, ban if if private business and isn't isn't borrowing for investment, and if households aren't borrowing to spend, or at least if they're not spending what they have, 
the only two ways are to depreciate your currency and hope that that increases your foreign demand, and that's what the 1930s was called beggar thy neighbor. That's kind of what Japan's doing now, but not everybody can do that. I mean, it, 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 because it's, 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 it's kind of a zero-sum game if you, if you do that. Um, you, you may benefit, but the person whose currency is going up, uh, it takes the loss. The other way to do it is by increased government spending. That's what Keynes said. Just go out there and force the spending. Um, that can lead, unfortunately, to bad uh, uh, decisions by, by Congress or, or administrations. In the case of the Depression, I mean, they, you know, they, they um, dug holes to fill them up. I mean, that, as you can see, that could have a very, very bad effect on productivity. But there are also good ways for the government to spend. We could, for example, give incentives, to, and we do, by the way, uh, over the past 40 years, we've given incentive businesses to invest more, give them, give them uh, basically tax benefits uh, for a while, and, and that's all well and good, but ultimately you need, you need demand, uh, and, uh, and so yes, monetary policy, it, 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 uh, we, wish it were, we wish it worked better. It does work, but it, they're, they're definitely, uh, the, the, the liquidity trap is basically that Keynes described is if the situation gets bad enough that businesses uh, are fearful and um, they conserve their cash and they don't borrow, uh, and if banks are, are fearful for their, uh, their existence, they'll not lend. And so, yes, that, that no question but what um, the, the Fed would have liked or would like to, um, the, the, the increase in their monetary base to have a more positive impact, a, a huge or bigger impact. Um, and if they if it did, then they wouldn't have had to increase their monetary base. But it doesn't, and that's exactly why they're increasing their monetary base. Got it. Well, I um, appreciate. I, mean, I know that a lot of this is very debatable, and we can go on about you know the benefits, other things. And there's this is just one piece of a very complex puzzle. But I, for one, um, appreciate just the basics of understanding when we start talking about monetary policy about the Fed balance sheet and about money supply that we also think to remember about the velocity and the other factors that often don't get talked about. So it can help us gauge, um, you know, create our own um, uh, thought process on what we, you know, think people are talking about and how, uh, so that really is helpful to me. So thank you very much. And we have one more comment, David, I'll leave you with, and then um, maybe you can comment. And if on I it. could, I want to make one more too, but okay. go ahead. Okay, so um, the la one more comment from, the stu from um, one of our students is, are stock prices boosted by QE since we are pushing on a string? And I think that you've spoken about that before, um, but then he also just goes on to say, it appears to me that the supply of money via QE has boosted stock prices. And then he thanks you very much for your time and your expertise. He feels the call has been excellent. So thank you for that. But if you wanna make any comment about the um, thief statement, or if you have a final closing comment, that would be fine too. Okay, well, let me, let me make two quick comments, and, and thank you for that compliment. Um, uh, number one, yes, it definitely had to kind of respond. Yes, it's driven up asset prices. And, and again, as I've written uh, uh, several times, um, the, the, there's uh, Don Patinkin, uh, who was a disciple or, or a student of and, and disciple, uh, really, really was one of the people who anticipated uh, the interaction of, of asset prices and the economy and, and the globalization. Um, and uh, he and, and Ed Feige, who were my teachers, were, were really, um, you know, I think they kind of took monetary policy beyond Friedman. And Friedman was great. He deserved the most Nobel Prize, but things changed. And so, yes, uh, the whole object was to drive up asset prices. It was pretty clear that housing prices weren't going to go up uh, when they started quantitative easing because of of uh, that's where the primary uh, source of the collapse was. But even housing prices are going up now. So again, the Fed, the Fed is getting what it wants, which is the increase in asset prices, which has spread out to um, uh, to housing prices, which is very big, as you know, for the public household. And this should therefore transmit into people feeling better and therefore spending more. And, and as I've discussed before, unfortunately, the benefits go disproportionately to those who have the money, that is, who have bigger houses and, 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 and more asset prices, which tend to uh, favor the wealthy. But that's, un that's an unfortunate um, consequence. I mean, it's not unfortunate that people with money have more money. It's unfortunate that it isn't spread more, more evenly to the people who, 
who uh, are uh, essentially living on the margin. And that really leads into my other comment, and that is I, I know I'm a big advocate of quantitative easing, and some people question that, but I'm, I, 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 there are downsides. I mean, there, there's no question but what their side effects of quantitative easing. But you know, I want to remind people the Fed doesn't, it's not like the Fed wants to do quantitative easing. It'd like to get out of the business of doing quantitative easing. And, and that's why I've likened it to chemotherapy. Um, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, uh, a, a medicine that has bad side effects is the only medicine that gives you a shot at a cure. And, and that's exactly how I see quantitative uh, easing. It, uh, it, you know, if you want to say, oh, David, it has this downside, it has that downside, yeah, there are downsides of quantitative easing. But if they hadn't done quantitative easing, um, if they would have tried to keep interest rates higher, as some people like Rick uh, have, have advocated, then the, the Q would have gone down and P would have gone down and we would be even worse off. So, uh, again, um, I, I certainly admit to, to, to side effects, uh, and that's why you need a strong and a, an intelligent Fed. Uh, and, and I think we have one and now to uh, basically work that razor's edge to, to bring us back to the kind of prosperity we would have in more normal times and end quantitative easing. Okay, cool. Hey, David, we have a question um, from Peter, if you uh, have a minute. Yes, I, I just have a question. Um, what, what is your call on interest rates? Um, you know, there's some people like Gary Schilling still s saying that uh, in coming quarters he feels rates are headed down, but we're going into this, you know, a tapering in the near term, anywhere from tomorrow to um, to March, they say. And there's other firms like Merrill Lynch and a few of the houses, uh, bigger houses, thinking rates are headed higher, you know, up to a full percentage point higher on the uh, 10 and 30 year. What is your call, like me, say in the next six months to a year? Uh, on rates. Um, it's a great question, and I don't want to pretend like I, 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 I have a lot of confidence or know the answer, but uh, my perspective is following. First of all, Gary Schilling, who, who I know and have followed for years, you know, he's a perma bear, and so I, I don't really trust him. I mean, he, he would say rates are going down in the best of times. Um, and uh, on the other hand, I'm not saying he doesn't have a lot of insights. And I know Dennis Gart. Well, Dennis Gartman, I, I grew up in the same neighborhood. Uh, I mean, he loves Gary, uh, and 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 I think Gary has contributed a lot of perspective. But I would not trust his his forecast of rates going down because they're always going down with him. Now, as far as the the, the firms that are saying they're going up, I mean, there's a big. Um, Division. I mean, some people are certainly going way up because they have this recent experience in July, where even the talk of tapering drove the um, uh, drove the uh, ten-year note from about 164 up to three uh, percent in a very short period of time. However, um, and, and I kind of once compared this uh, partly with tongue-in-cheek to um, to an experiment. I think the Fed wanted to throw out the idea of tapering, and not to say that they knew they weren't going to taper, but they, they certainly wanted to see how the market react, and they found out. But I think investors and, and commentators and people have a much better sense now of what could happen, uh, and the Fed has admitted it was surprised by the degree to rates rise. So I'm, I'm not as pessimistic as the people that say, for example, the 10-year note's going to go to 4% or, or above within a year. And there aren't many of those people, but I'm, I mean, I kind of just call myself here in the consensus that, yeah, it's probably likely to have somewhat an upward effect. I think we'll probably retest and go through 3%. Uh, my forecast for, for six months is we go – uh, to say about three and a half percent, I'm sorry, three and a quarter percent. Whereas uh, Arjun, who's more of an expert than I am, specifically in the treasury and the in the bond market, I think he's looking for three and a half. I, I certainly see that. I, I mean, I, I certainly see that's possible. But I would say, and this is going to you're going to think I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth now. Um, it could be that when they actually start. Um, it, it, it could actually lead uh, to rates going down as well. I mean, if I had to give you a rate between now and mid-year, I would say it's possible that we could go down again uh, as low as, as as two and a quarter to two and a half, uh, which is a person like David Rosenberg, who I really respect, uh, was looking for. I, I'm not, I haven't read his latest stuff. Um, so I, I would be very cautious about rates. If you have to... Um, if you have to make a bet, I would be pretty well hedged here because I think it's not um, 
not clear which way they're going. Now, let me finish with what I think about the stock market, and that will give you the reason why I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. I think there will be another correction in the stock market like there was in July. I don't think it will be a horrible one, but you know, all the corrections since that uh, May, June, July correction have been very, very minor and very, very muted. When they actually start tapering, I wouldn't be surprised to see a 5 to 10% correction in the market. And it's not a, not a bear market. I give it, as I wrote in my most recent comment, uh, maybe about 50-50 that it, it even exceeds uh, 10%. So, yeah, I think it will be meaningful. If that's the case, that will tend to hold Treasury rates down because people will begin to fear, oh, my gosh, the market's going down, all this asset prices increase is being unwound, et cetera. So, I think the next six months are going to be very difficult on rates. I don't think they're going to go too high because I think a correction in the market would probably buffer any upside. At the same time, I I do see some possibility for downside. But, you know, if you take a four- or five-year period, I think we'll normalize in interest rates, and interest rates are going to go back up to normal ranges. And to be normal ranges, it probably would have to be, um, uh, say, the 10-year note would probably have to have a – a real rate uh, of, of somewhere around 1%. I mean, that may seem low to you, but um, 1%. So if you think of inflation as, as say, um, 2 to 2.5%, which is the Fed's target, and yet you throw another percent, that gives you uh, basically about 3 to 3.5%. Um, do rates overshoot? Yeah. Will we see 4% in the next three or four years? Yeah, probably so, maybe 4, 4.5%. Four but I don't see a lot of upside on interest rates because – um, uh, they, they, they basically, um, if, if I'm right on growth, and if, if I'm right on nominal um, uh, no, nominal growth exceeding uh, uh, real growth uh, of say, let's say real growth turns out next year to be two and a half to three uh, percent, add maybe a, a percent or two percent to to that, um, you don't really have the case for rates, uh, in my opinion. Uh, in 2014, going uh, going above three and a half percent. Okay. And as I say, my forecast for the first half is a range. Let's just say, for talking purposes, of of 250 to three and a quarter. And one and one other question on the short end. When do you think? Uh, just throw a number. When do you think the Fed's going to start raising rates? Do you think we got a couple of years, or what do you what do you think on you the know, Fed funds rate? I, I, the, 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 Janet Yellen um, is, is an advocate in a recent Fed study of, of it, when they begin to taper to assure investors uh, and, and businesses that rates are going to stay down for an extended time. So they're definitely thinking of making the statement that uh, we expect rates to remain at the current low, short-term rates, of uh, policy, short-term policy rates to remain the same here until 2015. But as this new uh, 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 candidate for vice chairman of the Fed, Stanley Fisher, who who really taught a lot of these people, he, he's very skeptical of that, despite the Fed study and despite Janet Yellen's view. And by the way, these, these, these two people have incredibly mutual respect for each other. But it's just a difference of, 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 of concern. Uh, and I have to say I'm kind of sympathetic to, uh, to Fisher on this, much as I love Janet Yellen and, and her work. Um, uh, in the end, the Fed's got to do what the Fed's got to do. And they will never get the forecast exactly right. They're good. They're, they're better than most private, not all, but most private forecasters. And so if inflation is at two and a half by the end of 2014, which I think it could be, you're going to start seeing talk of rising short-term rates next year. And, um, and, and, and I think that's a 50-50 shot. Uh, so, um, and, and by the way, market rates will, it, it, you know, could come even a little earlier than it's certainly going to come earlier. I mean, market rates will lead policy rates. Market rates will show the Fed that uh, inflation is beginning to rear its head, that uh, uh, that people are skeptical of the Fed policy. So, I, I would I would not be surprised to see that happen in the second half of 2014. Cool. All right. Thank you very, very much. And um, I thank you all for joining. I appreciate it. We're going to post a copy of the call in the homeroom so you can access it again or share it with other students or other colleagues. And um, if you have any you know, questions, of course, don't hesitate to ask us and let us know about topics you care about learning more about. And we can put some more calls on the beginning of next year. But I can't believe it's the end of the year already. But um, but thank you very much. 
David, thank you for your time this afternoon. It was very informative, and I appreciate it very much. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. All right. All right. Susan, um, okay. are you up for a call? Thank you. Uh, Dave, yeah, give me a call in a few minutes after I close out. Okay. Okay. All right, everybody else, thank you so much. Um, you know, you know, you know where to reach me if you need me, and uh, have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you. Bye-bye.